Thank you everybody for coming to this early talk. I'm uh, very pleased to see you here. I'm very honored by this invitation. Uh, well, many people have temples of knowledge in their minds. And maybe the location of those precise temples might be a personal thing. But for me, it is this very room, this very building. Uh, so the Hebrew University has been a temple of set theory since 1929 when Abraham Frankel uh, became a professor here. It wasn't on this campus, so uh, the campus of the Hebrew University at the time was on Mount Scopus. And this campus and this room exist since 1958. And I think it's a very, very uh, appropriate place for Menachem to celebrate his contribution to mathematics so far. Uh, and. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. I have heard many excellent mathematicians giving talks in this room when I was a postdoc at Witt Menachem and with Sahron uh, here for two years. So uh, let me also thank you, of course, the organizers for uh, inviting me here. And let me also thank to somebody else. This is a friend who you all know, David Aspero. <laughs> So he's saying hello, and he made a big gift to this conference. OK, so as most of us have done, I will, of course, start my talk by saying a few words about Menachem. But please allow me not to talk about uh, his results immediately. I'd like to say something else about him. Uh, so I'd like to describe Menachem by what they call an antithetical definition. So uh, an antithesis, that is something that's totally the opposite of Menachem, OK? <laughs> so let me tell you a story from the history of mathematics. Uh, well, <laughs> let us see. Let us see what you think of the story. So let me tell you the story of the cubic equations. Um, so it seems like the idea of giving credit to people for their theorems is quite recent. And it comes to the Renaissance Italy. Before that, people just did mathematics. But then uh, at that time, they started to do uh, giving credits for theorems, basically the way that we do it now. Perhaps a little bit more wide, let us say, in a little bit wilder way. So let me tell you how that was in the case of the cubic equation. Maybe some of you know this story. So it was one of the biggest problems in mathematics in the 16th century. So uh, Scipio Ferro seems to have solved it in about 1500, but he didn't want to tell a living soul because he wanted to keep the secret for himself. Uh, but he did, at the end, didn't want to publish it. And he did tell the secret in 1505 to his student, Floridas, because uh, Ferro was uh, uh, ill and he wanted the secret to be passed on. And Floridas made good use of it, but it wasn't clear what he actually knew. And Tartaglia solved the problem in 1535. He really solved it, and, um, but he didn't want to publish it. <laughs> uh, so uh, after some years, Cardano, you have heard of Cardano's formulas from the cubics, I'm sure. Maybe learn them at school. He extracted the secret from Tartaglia by giving all kinds of promises that he will not tell anybody, but that his uh, scientific curiosity is such he has to know the secret. And then he published it under his own name in 1545. <laughs> so this is the opposite of Menachem. What I know about Menachem, and I've had many occasions to witness this, is an enormous generosity with his ideas. Many times I was uh, present in situations when credit was due to Menachem, wasn't given, he didn't say a word. Or even some people would say, well, Menachem, you proved this, like yesterday. And he, he would say, really, me prove that? No. <laughs> so uh, he has always shared his ideas in the most generous way. You can just sit and talk to Menachem. He'll never ask you what you did with his dots. Is this going to become a paper dot? Why did he spend five hours of his rather precious time with you? Never did he ask that question. 
And I think his contribution as a mathematician is enormous, but also is his contribution to this whole community that we have in set theory in many ways he contributed, and I'd like to thank you for that, Anna. And now a little bit about your results. Ah, oh, yeah, I forgot that they went to a war <laughs> over credits. <laughs> uh, let's then uh, just, uh, I chose a topic to talk about because it's a topic of a joint paper that I have with Menahem, a topic which interests me, but I would like to tell you some of his results on this topic that have nothing to do with me and uh, are really uh, cornerstones of the whole topic of the combinatorics of singular cardinals. So it was hard to choose the result to present because he proved many. Uh, I chose three results in three different time periods. So here is one result that comes from a long series of four papers that Cummings, Foreman, and Magador wrote about squares. So this was a, a very nice series of papers in which they combined forcing techniques, PCF, and so this is one example of their results from a paper published in 2001 in Journal of Math Log uh, Logic. So from the consistency of infinitely many supercompacts, they get this uh, tight, uh, probably the best possible correction of a square and reflection because the square and reflection don't fit together, but they proved that in this particular instance you can have quite a lot of the square and quite a lot of reflection together. So this is, uh, this notation square aleph omega omega means the square sequence between aleph omega and aleph omega plus, where at every point you have omega many choices for, for the square. Okay, then uh, more recent work. This is something to appear, worked with Laura Fontanella, uh, which again from the same, uh, from the same uh, assumption shows that both the tree property and stationary reflection can hold at Aleph omega squared plus one. Uh, we shall hear a lot about the tree property from Dima and from James, so I want uh, dwell too much on, on this, I'll let them tell you more about it, but I will tell you that the first result about the tree property at successors of singulars, I think is this paper from 1996 by Magidor and Schellach, in which they took an assumption, something between a huge and a too huge, and proved that the tree property can hold at aleph omega plus one. Okay, so now let me uh, then go to talk a little bit about the work that we have done together. But let me also tell you why it is so special to work at singular cardinals and their successors. What is, what, why is it so interesting? Well, basically the singular cardinals are a place where the reflection properties of the universe mean that the, the ZFC has much more power than at, uh, successors of regulars. And, well, that, that is reflected by many theorems that we already know. Uh, for example, the most striking phenomenon is the singular cardinal hypothesis, which has been a central part of investigation in set theory. So, this means, of course, that forcing at such cardinals is difficult, that involves, it must involve large cardinals. So we cannot just be sitting there forcing. And this we can see by looking, for example, at the Jensen covering lemma, which <coughs> says that if there are no large cardinals in the universe, then SCH is true. Uh, so even just changing the cardinal arithmetic is difficult, and uh, wanting to do more combinatorial properties, of course, is more difficult, even more difficult. Sometimes it's impossible. We know about the PCF uh, theory, which says, for example, that there is a ZFC bound on 2 to the aleph omega. If 2 to the aleph n is less than aleph omega for every n, then 2 to the aleph omega is less than aleph omega 4. So you cannot just be adding subsets. And also what is interesting in this subject is that the countable and uncountable cofinalities are quite different. And this is something that was a, a quite, a, quite a celebrated work of Silver on the one hand and Menahem on the other showed that 
for example, a singular cardinal of uncountable covenancy cannot be the first to fail GCH, so Silver proved this in 1975, and uh, modular large cardinals Magidor showed in 1977 that Aleph Omega can. So there is a very different behavior between uh, countable and uncountable covenality. So these difficulties that we have for forcing, or if you want these uh, truths in ZFC, carry over to successors of singular cardinals. So uh, for some years now, I have been interested in obtaining some forcing axiom, if possible, as such cardinals. And so it's a difficult task. It's an ongoing task, which uh, I will tell you some of the instances of it that we know. Uh, so for example, yesterday we saw a sort of a forcing axiom. So I want to remind you of a theorem that Moti presented yesterday. This is a kind of a forcing axiom which has a caveat. So here is what Moti told us yesterday, is if you have a GCH and you have a kappa compact cardinal kappa, then you can find a cardinal preserving forcing extension such that there you have sort of a forcing axiom. Every uh, kappa distributive forcing notion of size kappa has a generic over V. However, uh, what happens is that we can only look at the Qs in V. Well, this looks like the first step of forcing a forcing axiom, but this is not possible in this kind of situations because kappa becomes singular after this extension already in kappa, uh, of countable cofnality in VP. Uh, so uh, if we have a dream of some sort of forcing axioms, they are, of, they are rather different than the ones that we know from, uh, from regular cardinals. Okay. Uh, so let me uh, show you a specific instance that we have been studying in several papers uh, with the idea of this being sort of uh, the first non-trivial combinatorial thing that you might think after you already know how to move the cardinal arithmetic. So this study is the embeddings of graphs. So just to remind you what this means, if we have an infinite cardinal, we can consider the embeddings between graphs which preserve the edge and the non-edge relation. And uh, this gives us a, an order between the graphs. And we can look at the dominating number of that order, if you want, or cofinality number. And we call, I'll call this UK for this talk. So we are interested to look at UK for various values of K. Kappa, sorry, U kappa for kappa and kappa plus where kappa is singular. So let me just tell you that if GCH holds this, this investigation is not very interesting because it follows from classical results in model theory that there is always a universal graph. <coughs> uh, for the success of a regular cardinal, it was observed a long time ago by Sahron that co-enforcing co gives the consistency of the number UK being the largest possible being the two to the kappa, why do I say UK? U kappa equal to two to the kappa larger than kappa plus. And this is something that is was considered by him so trivial that he didn't even write the proof. It's an easy proof. Uh, I mentioned that because we shall try to see what this proof does in the case of the success of a singular and you'll see it's not trivial at all. <coughs> but let me continue with other successors of regulars you can also have u kappa between kappa plus and 2 to the kappa. And this was done for Aleph 1 by Meckler and Schellach in two different papers. And uh, we have done it with Schellach in general, with the difference that Meckler and Schellach can get one universal graph, and we don't know how to do it in general. Now let us move to the successors of singulars. So uh, the following theorem was obtained in a paper that Sahron and I published in 2005 for countable cofinality, and in a paper that we have with five authors, uh, Cummings, Magidor, Morgan, Shellach, and myself, accepted modular revisions. So I hope it will soon be really accepted if the referee likes our revisions. Uh, so this is what we proved. Uh, so if we have a super compact cardinal, we take some 
cardinal which is less than it, call it lambda, and we take a cardinal theta which is greater or equal than kappa plus three, which has cofinality at least as large as kappa double plus. Then we can find the forcing is extension in which the cofinality of this cardinal kappa becomes lambda. Uh, two to the kappa and two to the kappa plus become theta, which is at least as large as kappa plus three. And u at kappa plus is less or equal than kappa plus two. So what we have here is that the u number is smaller than the si maximal possible size. Uh, so I know there are many cardinals here uh, that we fixed at the beginning, but the point is that we can do any cofinality, so that's why we have this lambda. And as I said, at, uh, in our paper in 2005, we could only do countable cofinality. The proofs are similar, but uh, this one is exponentially more complicated. Uh, the, our proof with Sahron uses prickly forcing at the end of some iteration. <coughs> Uh, to change the cofinality of kappa 12 of zero. This uses ray forcing, and one important part of what you can do with prick reinforcing doesn't work with ray forcing. Namely, in this paper, we have used the fact that the, prick the direct extension in prick reinforcing is kappa close. This is not true with ray forcing, And that was a major block, and actually Menachem gave an idea of how to overcome it. And then we very all worked very hard on this paper to get it to this present shape. Uh, but let's see what else I want to say about this. I would like to notice that in this extension, the cofinality of two the kappa plus is kappa double plus. In fact, uh, uh, what we have in these papers always is that the universality number u corresponds to the cofinality of two to the kappa plus. And, uh, Actually, well, you will see, the, this means also, of course, that the cofinality of two to the kappa is equal to kappa double plus. And you will see by a result that I will present in a minute that this is quite important because, for example, if we had that the cofinality of two to the kappa was kappa plus, we could say much more. Uh, so let me just say that in this model, we do not know if we can get more than this. And what is, more, we don't know if this is actually always true. For all we know, this might always be true with no other assumptions. Uh, that is, at the success of a regular, there is this easy proof by coin subsets which shows us that we can make u as large as we like. But we don't have that kind of proof here, and we have studied this in detail to see if we can somehow make a mimic that proof in this context. We cannot, so for all we know, this number could always be one. Well, actually, I'm going to show you an old result by Menachem Koizman, and that shows that this is not always one, but, but it depends on the cofinality of two to the cup. So let me just show you some ideas of this proof. I'm showing you these ideas because the proof actually has been used recently by other people in other contexts uh, to prove things consistent at, the, at, the, at a singular cardinal. I'll mention some of those results. Uh, so the, the major idea of this proof is to iterate forcing, which will blow up the power of kappa, which does whatever you want to do, in this case, to build the universal graphs. And uh, it controls the names in the radian forcing of graphs on kappa plus, so the names of graphs on kappa plus in some rate enforcing. But you see the rate enforcing that you will use at the end, you don't know it in advance because you're all the time adding subsets of kappa. So anything that looks like a measure on kappa or a sequence of measures, it's not going to look like that anymore once you have, done, have finished. So what's important in this argument is that we are actually building the measure sequence as we go. So we are guessing this measure sequence and the point of it is that we build it in a way that there is a reflection of that measure sequence that we uh, have along the iteration. Uh, so anyway, then the universal family, we do this iteration for lambda many steps. So lambda is the value of the two to the kappa at the end. 
but we get this universal family as a cofinal sequence of certain graphs, uh, cofinal in lambda. And so, as I said, the main point is that uh, the rated names or prickly names with respect to the measure sequence that we built are reflected by the names of the radial forcings that appear during the iteration. So we can control them somehow. So this, is ty this reflecting type of behavior is what we would like to encapture in a forcing axiom. Uh, so far without a satisfactory formulation. There have been many candidates, uh, epic fails as uh, Matt would make, call them. Uh, so. so let me tell you about this result by Menahem. Uh, so in fact, that's a theorem that appears as a statement, a very general statement in a paper by Koizman <coughs> and Shellac in 93. And then Menahem Koizman has this unpublished note from 95 in which he works specifically with graphs, but in many more instances than the one that interests me here. So I'm just going to translate what he did into, into what interests us here. So if we have that the cofinality of 2 to the kappa is kappa plus, which is less than 2 to the kappa, then there is no universal graph in kappa plus. So in our theorem, we have that the cofinality of 2 to the kappa it cannot be kappa plus because it's equal to 2 to the kappa plus. But here you see if uh, in this situation we don't have a universal graph. And let me show you the proof, a sketch of this proof. I'm using this unpublished note by Menahem. So the major idea is to use incidence graphs. These are bipartite graphs where you take a family of subsets of kappa and this family, in this case, that interests us will be of size kappa plus. And we connect that with kappa. So on one side, we have the family. On the other side, we have kappa. And we make an edge if and only if the ordinal alpha belongs to the set A in the family. We call these graphs gamma A. And now using this fact that the cofinality of 2, kappa, two, two to the kappa is equal to kappa plus, we can find the co-final family B zeta zeta less than kappa plus in the family of subsets of kappa of size kappa plus. So what it means for it to be co-final is that the incidence graphs of these B zeta actually dominate the incidence graphs of, of all the A's means that for every A, we can find the zeta <coughs> such that gamma A is edge-preservingly embedded into gamma B zeta. So there are more edges in B zeta than there are in, uh, in gamma A. And now what we do is to suppose that there is a universal graph, and we just look at the embeddings of those specific B zetas. They all of size kappa plus. And now we're going to diagonalize to make an A which will actually avoid them all. So construct by a diagonalization, A subset of P of, kappa of size kappa plus, such that it obeys following. Uh, sorry for those two dots that appear after the last sign. For every zeta less than kappa plus, there is an alpha less than kappa and an X in this A, such that alpha is an X, but f zeta of alpha is not in the relation with f zeta of x. So this means that gamma a does not embed into gamma b zeta u, or that gamma b zeta does not embed into gamma star. Anyway, in any case, we get a contradiction. So it's a nice argument. As I said, it's much more general in, in, in their work, but that's what we wanted here. So let me also now mention some other results that uh, do not have to do with uh, always with universality, but some other results in this context. Uh, so uh, in a paper that we did with James and uh, Charles Morgan, we can push our results from an arbitrary uh, singular cardinal to aleph omega. So we get that aleph omega is a strong limit 2 to the aleph omega is 2 to the aleph omega plus 1 is equal to aleph omega plus 3. But the universality number for graphs on aleph omega plus 1 is at most aleph omega plus 2. Uh, 
So this is kind of a machine that is a complicated machine uh, that is made for changing results that you might have for, for an arbitrary cardinal of countable cofinality to aleph omega. So this is called putting, pushing things down to aleph omega. Uh, there exists a technique like that also for other cofinalities, for example, for pushing things down to aleph omega 1. And let me mention here a friend who has made her career in other subjects now. She's a famous video artist, but many of you probably remember Miri Segal, who was a student of Menahem and who uh, uh, wrote about this technique in her master thesis in Hebrew, which was not available for many years, but then students of Moti and Moti himself took up this subject, I think, and uh, developed it more. Isn't it true that Karmi Merimovic took this up? Yeah. So uh, Karmi Merimovic uh, worked on this, and now we can learn these techniques. So uh, it is perfectly uh, reasonable to believe that a similar result can be obtained uh, at Aleph Omega 1, for those of you who are strong in these techniques. Uh, there was a student of James Cummings, who unfortunately didn't decide to continue in mathematics, if I con understood well, who started working on this. And I just hope that this method did not <laughs> chase him out of mathematics. <laughs> so let's see some other results. Uh, so here is a more recent result. It's due to Garty and Shellach. Now this goes back to uh, to our original paper with Shellach. So they wanted to see if something else can be said combinatorially in that kind of model. So it is actually the same kind of model with the pre for So there is an iteration, then there is a pre forcing at the end. Uh, so what they considered is the minimal size of a filter base for a uniform ultrafilter on kappa. So a filter base means that you have a family of elements of the filter such that every element of the filter is almost contained in an element of the base. Uh, and so this is kind of a cardinal invariant. And well, now a different modification of our paper appears in a recent preprint by Brooke Taylor, Fisher, Friedman, and Montoya. So they were interested to get results on, the, on, the car, so on a super compact cardinal without singularizing. So what they did is to look at the first part of this technique for building a specific measure on a super compact cardinal and to uh, interleave this with sort of Matthias forcing. So what they obtained is the following theorem. Suppose that you have a super compact cardinal uh, and some regular cardinal kappa star, which is larger than it, and something even larger, which is uh, going to become 2 to the kappa at the end. <coughs> so then what they can do, they can find a cardinal preserving forcing extension in which kappa is still super compact. And all cardinals from the generalized Chihon diagram and many other cardinals on kappa, when interpreted on kappa, become kappa star. So A, B, D, uh, all of these cardinals. Also the uniformity number uh, for ultrafilters, they all are small, so they are kappa star, and two to the kappa is equal to theta. So two to the kappa is large. So I should mention that this is quite an interesting subject to look at the Chihon diagram in uh, a generalized way because it offers many surprises. Uh, so the first paper about this was by Cummings and Shellach in 95, I believe. Uh, they, they look at the Weser cardinals from the Chihon diagram on, and they looked at universes with certain inequalities held everywhere. But there are many things to discover here. For example, even when you look at the, the order kappa to the kappa, now when kappa is equal to omega, the only reasonable order you look here is eventual dominance. So modulo event. But when you have a large kappa, you have many different orders that you might consider. Modulo uh, dominance, modulo a stationary set, modulo a club, modulo a set of size less than kappa. And there, there are some surprises that are offered by this kind of argument. 
And I'm also going to show you an earlier application of our method, which uh, also is, uh, gives me opportunity to talk about the problem that's still open on Aleph 1. So let me uh, uh, tell you about this result uh, by Komiat, Morgan, and myself, published in 2004, uh, which was an application of this method, uh, well, a modification of this method from the paper with Sahron to a question that we learned from Peter Komiat, which is known in the Hungarian speak as Q kappa. Well, I'll tell you what Q kappa is. It unfortunately involves several quantifiers, uh, so it's not that easy to remember, but let me tell you. What we're we looking on for uh, certain edge colorings of a graph. So what we want, we have our graph X, which better be of large chromatic number, otherwise the thing doesn't make sense. And we want to have an edge coloring of this X, so the coloring of edges, such that this uh, edge coloring kind of uh, uh, rainbows every vertex coloring. So what this means, you have this edge coloring, now you take whatever vertex coloring you want, and you will find uh, a G color class in which your C has every value. C is the edge coloring. So this is the C. Now you color the, the vertices by some G. And there will be a G color class in which C takes every value. So this, it is not known if Q of Aleph 1 is always true. So many models are known where Q of Aleph 1 is true. And uh, Q of Aleph 1 for a specific kind of graphs, which are the complete graphs, mm -hmm. is what's behind the celebrated result by Todorcevic on partitioning pairs of uh, countable ordinals, so the rainbow coloring of countable ordinals. So this is a much more general idea. Uh, well, so what we were able to do is to prove that you can have this kind of wild colorings of graphs uh, on a successor of a singular cardinal. So what we have therefore is that we do our technique, we obtain modulo supercompact, a singular strong limit cardinal mu, which has cofinality omega, such that every mu plus chromatic graph on mu plus, so we have to restrict the size, has an edge coloring into mu many colors, for which every vertex coloring g of x into again mu many colors has a g color class on c which takes every value. So q of aleph 1 would mean you want the coloring of graphs of size aleph 1 into which have uncountable chromatic number into countably many colors such that every vertex coloring into countably many colors has a color class in which the edge coloring takes every value. Okay, well, I think that I will finish here. Thank you very much for your attention.